Hi, thank you so much for joining us today uh, for another episode of Weekly Wisdom. My name is Bridget Burns. I'm the Executive Director of the University Innovation Alliance. Hello, I'm Paul Fain, the news editor inside higher ed, joining Bridget this week. Uh, thank you again for being my uh, in my next co-host. Very excited to, to spread the, the microphone around. So thanks for, for agreeing to this. Um, each week, for those of you who are at home, if you're not familiar, we bring you a short, uplifting interview with a sitting college president or chancellor. And the intention is for, to, for us to unpack and highlight their leadership, how they're looking at this moment, and how they're able to stay inspired and hopeful despite everything that's going on. And this week, we are very excited this is Weekly Wisdom for them. Uh, and Paul, you want to? Yeah. So this week, my first week, we're talking with Ruth, Ruth Watkins, president of the University of Utah. Ruth, thanks for doing this. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. So to start, you, like all of your peers, have quite a bit going on. How are you holding up right now? You know, quite well, really. I'm an optimistic person by nature, so that helps. And I would also say I do miss people. So I appreciate the chance to connect uh, virtually and we're beginning to do a few things back on campus and that helps a lot too. So pretty positive overall. Great, so um, now with everything going on with the global pandemic, uh, as well as the uh, vocal support that we're seeing for uh, against racial injustice throughout this country, um, it's a very complex time to be a leader. It's complex time to be a university president. And so I'm just wondering about if you can share, for those of us who may not be familiar with your leadership philosophy and kind of how you're looking at this moment, how are you inspiring folks? How are you able to see a path forward when there's just really so much going on and so many challenging um, circumstances? It's an incredible privilege to be able to do work that matters. And I think in this moment, both in terms of the pandemic and in terms of our clear uh, focus on the enormous price of inequality and systemic inequity and racism, I think the opportunity to be part of leading in higher education, a place that really can transform lives, support health and well-being, and make a difference on issues like racism, openly address white privilege, and take action to change racism. What a privilege that is. I have enormous gratitude that I have a job that's busy and important and occupies my energy and my talents. And I'm really grateful for that. It is an incredible privilege to be able to lead in an important time like this. And I think keeping that lens helps uh, with staying on the positives of things and not being overcome by the challenges. That's great. So everybody right now is experiencing a tremendous amount of uncertainty, anxiety, um, and yet uh, decisions need to be made. Um, how do you how do you inject optimism and purpose as a leader uh, in times where folks really don't know what's going to happen next week, let alone in six months? Right. So I think helping everyone understand and join with you is important. So we need participation. People will support what they help create and people will enact what they believe in and help create. So using groups and gaining wisdom from many, very important aspect. I think also uh, communication is always important for a university leader and probably for any leader to uh, think about multiple modalities, communicating many messages many times, and being patient and staying with that. Demonstrating kindness toward each other matters a great deal. Uh, but continuity, communication, information, and, and really, I think, acknowledging the fact that there, that there is quite a bit of anxiety around uncertainty, and we're in a situation that is new for all of us. So I think as we face this challenge, staying open to that, letting people know this is dynamic and changing, giving them sources of information, and involving as many people as you can in planning. Uh, all those are strategies that really help. That's useful. So you're in a, a, a rare situation uh, where you're president at an institution that you also served as provost. There are very few people who have that experience where you might, many have been provost, but to understand the real machinations of the job on your own campus um, and, and, and 
uh, the complexity uh, of both positions has got to be really unique. Um, what I'm curious if there are any leadership lessons from either when you were a provost or back in Illinois um, or early in your presidency. I mean, I know, I know that you've been president since 2018. Um, are there other leadership lessons that you are leaning on today that are helping you try and navigate this moment? So I think it really is helpful to um, know something about the institution that you're leading as you come in. You have maybe the most important lesson of leadership is how very important relationships are. Uh, relationships of trust and respect or how things get done in a university, maybe how things get done everywhere. So you want to spend time with people know your institution well, build on those relationships, uh, that social capital will really help in difficult times. And it also helps in great times because it helps you get work done. I think a philosophy that I live by is that alone we can do very little, but together we can do a lot. And that's Helen Keller's wisdom, not mine, um, but it really works in universities. You want to engage the institution. Yes, the leader's job is inspire, motivate, help, create the conditions where everyone can succeed, but it has to be a shared agenda. Uh, no one of us can really make that much difference. Collectively, enormous progress is possible. And I think that has been a real privilege here at the University of Utah. I have found such a collaborative spirit and a collective that really wanted to move the University of Utah forward we've been able to do a lot in terms of the success of our students, the impact of our research, and our role, what I like to say is not just the University of Utah, but the University for Utah. Uh, much has happened here because of that spirit of the collective impact and importance of the university. So obviously a time of profound rapid change, uh, maybe even unprecedented. Um, you know, I, one of my jobs as a journalist is to not ask speculative questions. It's pretty hard these days. So, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Watkins, I won't ask you to predict the future, but more to ask, you know, what from this moment, whether it's um, the activism around uh, racism, uh, you know, the pivot to online and all the many pieces that go into that, do, do you hope will really stick around for the long run? Any, any change that you've been through at the university lately that you hope is permanent? Mm -hmm. So it really is a great question. And I, I think it's important for us to say, really acknowledge that we, the pandemic and uh, the current situation in the world has helped us all gain awareness of the enormous price of inequality. And that is vital that we use this moment and build on it and change and act and be different and recognize systemic inequalities, processes and policies in our institutions that have perpetuated inequality and racism, uh, I think unintentionally, but it doesn't matter. This is a moment of change. The pandemic has laid bare for us, health disparities and unequal access to health. I think that is, this is a moment where we can be different, where we can act differently, where we can change as institutions we will lead society when we do that. I see around me an incredible spirit of kindness, of outreach uh, to others, uh, certainly the outpouring of our donor community towards our student emergency fund and towards research and health disparities around COVID-19. I, I hope that stays with us. And I guess one last thing I hope that stays with us is the pace has slowed uh, in terms of evenings and weekends. And I think the gift of time to spend with each other uh, however we can. Right now, it's families and small groups, but I hope that, that we learn something um, about our pace and about using our time for the collective good. Um, I think that may be a lesson we could take from the pandemic. That's okay. super helpful. So for those uh, folks who are working at home, well, first off, who are watching at home, they are working at home most likely, and they have likely kids and at home running underneath their feet. And uh, you know, the work-life balance is challenging. There's a whole lot happening. Um, for other college presidents, they, you know, you have these long-term things like a strategic plan, and you have, you know, all these initiatives that you need to move forward. I'm just curious about how, in the moment of just so much swirl, how do you? moderate yourself? How do you make yourself focus on the right thing and not be caught up in the noise? Like, are there any tips that help you 
you know, you've been through enough crises now uh, in, in your career to, to figure out how to do this. And I'm just curious because I know that this is something other people struggle with. Um, how do you tune it out and figure out exactly what to focus on and what to pay attention to in the midst of challenging, very uh, complex moments? I find it pretty helpful to remember how much the mission matters. I think one thing that we've learned through this pandemic and certainly looking at public opinion polls helps us see this. America, frankly, the world is looking to leading research universities to solve societal problems, to lead the way. And the trust and respect that Americans now have for their research universities has really grown through the pandemic. Uh, that helps me to focus because it reminds me how much the mission matters. The mission matters in terms of delivering research that will help people in America and the world. The mission matters in terms of our capacity to help the people who come to us finish the degrees that they came for and not to leave before that. And the mission matters a great deal right now as we think about how we put Americans back to work. And that will be learning new skills. And as the world changes, uh, how do we help upskill and reskill those who need the opportunity to re-enter the economy in a new way? Um, I think whenever you get caught up in an urgent situation of the moment, of course, those are important and they're going to keep happening. Uh, but it does help to step back and remember the mission. Why are we doing the work we do and who's counting on us to deliver it? Our communities, our stakeholders, our people. Um, and that's the research we do, the education we provide, the way we engage with and uplift communities. And certainly right now, the healthcare that uh, an academic medical center provides to uh, stakeholders from the state and the region. So the focus on the mission, why we're here and what a privilege it is to move that mission forward and how many people are depending on us, those things help me refocus on, on the important work that we do every day. You know, it wasn't like higher education was in a, a, a tranquil state before all of this. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of change, whether it's the demographic cliff, policy, et cetera, a lot, a lot going on. Um, now that's been accelerated greatly. What, what are some of the areas, looking beyond your university, that you, you're watching for change most closely across the academy? Um, what, what are some of the key areas that you think right now we might see rapid evolution change? Yeah. So I think it's it's pretty interesting question. And uh, if anything, I would say the pandemic, uh, the first day here at the University of Utah that we uh, were going online, we also had an earthquake that day, uh, which did seem like kind of a lot uh, all at once in the middle of March. And as I have thought about this and thought about the future, about disruption and uncertainty, it has made me realize that building greater continuity in our operations is going to be pretty critical for us going forward. Continuity in terms of educational delivery, hybrid uh, offerings, being able to shift to remote learning and even to help more people who cannot access us in person. And uh, that has kept them out of completing higher education or engaging in higher education. Continuity in how we do our work, being able to use a remote workforce more effectively. There's enormous opportunity for the institutions that can innovate and be creative and move ahead assertively. And I think that opportunity to better serve people is, is all around us. I think uh, one of the most remarkable things as we think about the future is uh, we were, you know, like many academic medical centers, making fairly slow progress in working towards telehealth delivery. Uh, the pandemic accelerated that massively. I think it would have taken us a decade to make the kind of progress we have in telehealth in a matter of weeks. Quite remarkable. and very positive reports from our stakeholders and consumers about what telehealth has done for them and how it fits their life better. So that is, uh, I think, pretty important for us to be asking those questions. And um, as we think about how we want to go forward, uh, we don't want to return to the way we were. We want to return to better. And that's the task in front of us. Okay, we, have, we have a question that came in uh, from LinkedIn. First off, 
John Pryor made a comment that Jeff Selingo grew a beard, which, um, so Paul, uh, that's, uh, you're his doppelganger now. Um, so, uh, but this question is, how do you balance the mission of the university and concerns of faculty and staff, especially ones who are older and who have health concerns about face-to-face -face operations in the fall? And I would, I would just say in general, John, I, I think that every president is thinking about balancing not just those, but probably a million other pieces of uh, competing uh, requests and needs. And uh, I think it's moving slowly and taking in. That's why they have like five different SWAT teams inside their institution, figuring out alternate scenarios. But um, but I'm curious, Ruth, if you have a response to this question as well. Yeah, I think John's question is a great one and one we get asked a lot. So of course, uh, you know, anytime you're in a in a town hall or a discussion with, with faculty and staff, uh, the question will come of, shouldn't we just stay remote in the fall? Is there a way we could do that? And I think that the tricky parts of answering that question are, uh, many of us believe that what happens on a college campus face-to-face -face, in a research university has enormous power, that connecting and engaging outside and beyond the classroom is, is powerful as well, that there is genuine value in that. And so, uh, staying on the sidelines is hard to do. Then the second piece of that, of course, is we don't really know how long the pandemic is going to last. It may be with us for quite a while when we listen to public health experts. Unsettling as that is, uh, that is relevant, as is the fact that our long-term viability as colleges, universities, and the mission we would provide to society um, is pretty important. We believe in it. So kind of as we chart the past path forward, we are charting a path of managing risk as successfully and well as we can. And of course, on the specific question of uh, students or faculty or staff who may have health conditions that make them more vulnerable, uh, we are working hard to provide temporary modifications in how things are delivered um, and in how we work to accommodate those or to address those when we can. Um, that work is in play, as, as has been noted, kind of dynamic, but I think uh, providing some guidance there and some uh, alternative and temporary work modifications will be helpful. Uh, and there may be students who, for whatever reason, um, feel that staying online and being able to access the university that way, as we have made possible, uh, is the best option for them. So we're trying to create this more dynamic, uh, fluid environment that allows some adaptations that meet people's needs as well as they can, while continuing to deliver on the important mission that society asks of us and, and what uh, they depend on. So managing risk uh, thoughtfully and as well as we can is, is the order of the day. It's a good question and a hard question. And we are all on it and on this journey together. So thanks. Paul, you have this last one. I, I would I would just add, I made a, a tweet last week about the topic of asking college presidents to describe and detail and commit to their plans for fall, that it was the same thing as asking me or anyone else if they want to lose 20 pounds. Yeah, I'd like to. Doesn't mean I'm going to. And also, I, nobody has a crystal ball. We like there's a million reasons why these, you know, we're going to have to walk very slowly into the future. And, and that's why the multiple scenarios. But um, anyway, yeah. So thank you for answering that. And Paul, did you want to wrap with the last question? Yeah. I, you know, I assume you don't have a, a tremendous amount of free time, uh, even before all this. But I wonder, uh, you know, what are you leaning on in terms of art? that you consume, books, movies, et cetera, uh, to kind of help you get through uh, this, this crazy time? Well, I am an avid reader, um, a lot about higher education, but I'm not gonna say that right now, because I think sometimes you need to uh, draw lessons for higher education from other places. So I'm reading uh, Richard Powers' The Overstory, which is just a phenomenal book, a vast book, with a lot of wisdom and a lot of lessons. Some of them are painful and difficult and some of them are hopeful. Uh, it's also just beautiful writing. So I think uh, having the capacity to think about big issues in the natural world and uh, the interconnectedness of humans and the environment and just a powerfully written novel, it's, it's good for everybody too. So thank you. You know, I read that one and it was amazing. And it was one of those novels that I said, I could never do that. Just 
an absolute tour de force. Yeah, I agree. A very, very gifted person. Yes. I still don't know where or when you're finding the time to read, but I am uh, very impressed <laughs> in terms of not just reading, uh, just even the news uh, about changes in higher ed and all the various publications. So, um, well, uh, President Watkins, thank you so much for taking the time with us today. We really appreciate you uh, inspiring us with a sense of perspective about what it's like to, to navigate this moment um, and uh, really kind of putting a human face on the leadership of these institutions. We know that too often people are I think uh, not understanding the complexity of the job and they don't have enough empathy for really uh, what it's taking. And this is a moment where we need the best leaders in the field and we wanna definitely be lifting them up. So uh, I count you definitely in that in that group. Um, so for those of you who are at home, if you're looking for past episodes and also this one of uh, Weekly Wisdom, you can go to the UIA's YouTube channel, but thank you again for folks at home and for Paul Fain uh, for stepping in and pinch hitting. We, uh, you are uh, a fantastic co-host and we look forward to working again together. So um, for those of you at home, we hope you have a wonderful week and uh, we hope this has given you a little bit of inspiration. So thanks everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for including me. Take care. <laughs>